So when I first started, I only did topless and I was pretty nervous. And then I got more nervous because some of my first subscribers were high school friends and old coworkers. So it's like, that's a whole different oh arena versus <laughs> complete strangers. If it's strangers, it's one thing. If it's your old high school acquaintances or crush, you're like, um, hi. Nicole Mitchell recently made headlines around the world when she went from being a Baptist pastor to an OnlyFans stripper, often posing nude for her paying subscribers and also helping them with life coaching. Today, she talks to me about what it was like growing up in a religious Southern Baptist community and how she spent many frustrated years celibate before taking the plunge and waking up as a new convert to the religion of sexy photos. We talk a lot about motivations, drives, and the very human need we all have for validation and sometimes attention in its various forms. She tells us what it was like to preach regularly in a mega church to thousands of devotees and how empowering it is now to pose for elegant nude model photos for tens of thousands of a very different kind of devotee. I was fascinated to get into the mind of someone who seems to live for that kind of buzz. Nicole is also a life coach, inspiring others around the world to reach their goals and follow in her footsteps. She no longer identifies as a Christian, but remains spiritual and believes in a higher power. She posts free content every day in her OnlyFans.com slash Nicole Mitchell website. She takes custom orders and gives her members a direct line to her through DMs, which are direct messages, and Skype calls. You'll find her on Twitter and Instagram on at Mitchell Nicole. That's her name in reverse. I'll also put her Facebook page and website in the show notes. A couple exciting things to tell you about. Uh, firstly, I'm going to start doing a Discord totally free. Now, what's a Discord? Because I only just found out. For the unacquainted, it's basically an old-fashioned chat room that I'll start doing once a week where listeners to the show can build a bit of a community. I'll do the first one on Thursday the 11th of February at 8pm GMT, which is 9pm where I am in Germany, noon in California, 3pm in New York, and quite early if you're in Australia, sorry. But maybe you can join by the end of it. I'll post a link to that in the show notes, and if you're interested, please do join. Uh, If we get big numbers, then we can make it a weekly thing. If we get small numbers, then it will be a bit embarrassing, and if no one comes, that won't be that embarrassing because nobody will know except me, but it might be a bit disheartening. I'll always ask the guest that week to come on, so there's a chance that Nicole will show up as well, so you can ask her all sorts of questions, and you can ask me about this episode and all of your favourite episodes, and we can get some discussions going. The second thing is I've added a new feature to Patreon for bonus content, so additional moments that wouldn't usually make the cut often as we're saying hello or goodbye on the Zoom call, will now be broadcast and you'll get that on Patreon. But today, I'll include the small bonus section. It's only one minute today and it will be longer in future episodes, but it will give you a taster of what it will be like in future so you can decide whether you want to sign up. That's patreon.com slash andrewgold. For now, I will leave you in the hands of the wonderful Nicole Mitchell. I mean, I'll also be there, but, you know, see you at the end. What is Ohio like? Are you from Ohio? What's Ohio? Yeah, I'm not from there, but I went there for college and it's small. I mean, I mean, it's a state, but it's mostly farm. My school is in the middle of a farm. Our our student population made up half the town's population. So when we left for the summer, it was a very, very small community. We all joked about being grateful to be gone from there. Where are you from? Um, I grew up everywhere. My dad, my dad was in the military. So we grew up all over the U S we lived in Europe. Um, and so I've, I don't have a state I call home, but currently I'm in California. Oh, okay. Lovely. Where in California? I'm in Orange County in Southern California. Oh, okay. The OC, California. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know about that. Well, jokes on me because I thought I was moving to like a super liberal place because like it's the West coast and I had no idea that Orange County is pretty conservative and I just laughed. I'm like, I thought I left the Midwest for the wild (laughs) liberal West. And no, it's like I'm right back in the Midwest in California. It's crazy. Is that because it's just is that wealthy people and they just become conservative? 
I mean, there's wealthy people all over California, so I'm not sure what makes this pocket so unique and so mm. religious and so conservative. Um, mm. But it is what it is, and so I've I feel very familiar with this space because of how I grew up. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's such a shame that you were trying to get away from that, I suppose, and you've ended up right in the middle of it. How did I you did. grow up? Tell me a bit about your upbringing. What would seem strange for some guy from London like me? Yeah, well, for me, it, you know, like for all of us, we all have our childhoods that seem normal to us. And for me, I was raised in a really religious environment. I was raised Baptist with a family that was very involved in our church my entire life. Social community, friends was all found in my church mm. and grew up um, pretty strict. I grew up with three brothers and the only girl. And I noticed that from a young age, there was like a double standard. My brothers could stay out later. My brothers could just go hang out with friends without adults. I always had to stay home or have an adult chaperoning. Um, and for years wishing I was a boy because I wanted that freedom. Um, and just by observing, not even people explicitly telling me in my religious community, but just observing women's roles, I picked up on the messaging of what where I belonged. And that was in the kitchen or in the nursery with babies and tried so hard to fit that mold, even though naturally I'm just like a business guru and a leader. But I wouldn't discover that or allow that till much later in life. It's so funny because I've spoken to quite a few people who on the podcast who have left religions and all different ones, whether it be Mormons or uh, Islam, leaving Islam, leaving Hasidic Judaism. And that thing in common that they all have is this patriarchal system. Um, what It seems like that's the number one thing. And the number two is don't be gay. But the number one thing is like subjugate women. Why is that? Yes. Well, and I, I violate why, both of those categories. Like, <laughs> not that I'm gay, but I'm queer. And it's very okay. anti-queer. Um, yeah. I mean, it's a very efficient, effective system that you have an entire gender of people dedicated to serving your needs. Like, mm. they're going to cook for you. They're going to clean for you. They're going to bear your children. They're going to stay home and raise them while you go out and conquer the mm. world. Like, it's, it's really smart. Um, and really mm. toxic because mm. we are so much more than childbearing um, nursery taker care of ours. Like we have lives, we have passions, we have hobbies, we have businesses, we have dreams. And it's interesting, like me just trying to follow my heart and follow my dreams is seen as rebellious or going off the uh, deep end, like these negative assumptions and labels when I'm just trying to have the same rights and do the same thing that all these men are doing and have been doing. Yeah, it's really a strange thing. So how, when did that start to sort of affect your life to such a point where you, where you started to, I suppose I'm getting ahead really actually. I mean, did you did you have- So many things. Usually I would ask, so, oh, well, at what point did you start to have doubts? But then you became a pastor. So it must be that you didn't have too many doubts growing up. Yeah, there wasn't a room for them. You know, it really wasn't until I got married to my then husband it was the first time I was with someone who knew me so well, where he would like welcome and encourage my questions. And I noticed that all these questions had been like buried my entire life. Like I, I could finally bring it up. I'm like, well, what about this? And what about this? And this doesn't make sense. And, and it felt relieving to be able to like say my honest truth because that was never allowed in those spaces. And because of that safety with my then husband, I began questioning, why can't a woman be a leader in the church? This is ridiculous. And in my particular denomination, in the Baptist denomination, or at least in my family and our intimate community, women can be CEOs, we can be mm. presidents, we can be all these things in the world. But when it comes to the church, you are submissive and you're, you're not allowed to be a leader. And I saw that, I'm like, why am I allowed to lead everywhere else? But I can't even lead in the one place where like, I care the most. I love theology. I love scripture. I love my community. So even just seeing that dichotomy and that um, double standard was bizarre. So I started unpacking the beliefs that told me I'm not allowed to be a leader. I'm not allowed to be a pastor and realized I believe scripture is fine with women being pastors. Um, and even when my family freaked out about it, I, I said, can we just agree that the, that the fact that I just want to tell people that God loves them, that that's what I do, that me doing that with my life is actually a good thing. And I'm not like selling drugs or selling my body. Like, can we just at least agree on like out of all the things I could pick? This is a pretty good, safe route. Um, but that didn't really work. So yeah. And so I ended up becoming a pastor, but that was seen as rebellious and unbiblical for my people. And it was a, it was a really hard and scary thing for me back then. That's so interesting that becoming a pastor was the rebellion against the family. Yes, 
Absolutely. And how does one go about, I mean, if I wanted to, I mean, what you did is what I'm asking. If I want to become a pastor now, what do I do? Yeah, it's different in every religion. And I feel like in mine, in the evangelical sector, it's really like a job. You interview and you get hired as an employee. It's really Mm. bizarre because people are like, don't you have to have these trainings and you have to have like these degrees and then you have to be voted on by the church. And, And there are a lot of churches that do that. But for mine, it's very much just employer hiring employee, you are now in this position, this is what you will do. Um, But before they took me on to their team, I did spend three years in their mentoring program. I was preaching and teaching in all kinds of classes from kids to teens to adults, getting lots of practice showing it's capable. And then I was accepted and asked to be on their pastoral team. Wow. So they were pretty progressive then. If that was a problem for your parents, that you were a woman yes. who wanted to, be, you know, they were quite a progressive, uh, what is it, a chapel, parish? Yes. Yeah. Church. Mm-hmm. Mm, they were a progressive church. church. Yes. <laughs> They're all words. That, they're just like synonyms for me. I don't know what the difference between a parish, <laughs> yes. a chapel, a church, a chapel, any of this stuff. It's all. I think they're I, I all know. basically the same. And it's just like mm. denominational preference. I think in my denomination, we call it church and others, they call it chapel and Right. Others they called a parish. So yeah, all totally the same. But yeah, it was. It was it was liberating to be like, oh my gosh. And this is my late twenties. First time ever that I've been part of a church that taught that women were equal. And I look back at that, I'm like, are we not in the 21st century? Like why am I why is that a radical thing for me in my late twenties? But it just was because of the environment I grew up in. Wow, you should stay there. It sounds good. <laughs> We should all just go there. Just all those women, follow me. We're just going to thrive there. <laughs> go back to the church. That sounds really, it's, oh, it's a progressive gosh. church. No, do not do not do that. It sounds, I'm very anti-religion. <laughs> I don't like religion. I grew up mm-hmm. in a bit of, not a very religious family, but a bit of it as a kid. And I just, I'm very happy to have moved away from it personally. Mm-hmm. But tell me then, what is, um, we, we always hear, again, another one of these words that we just sort of all know the word. We all sort of know what it means, but Baptist it, I, right, I get that a baptism is the sort of, you know, head under the water or, or a glass poured on someone. Um, and you see it in films. We see it in like The Godfather that happens. And um, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? There's a thing about that Coen Brothers film. Um, but the Baptist, like a Baptist church, is that like an extreme church? Or is it like, because we think of the Westboro Baptist Church, of course, that's, that's mm-hmm. what springs to mind. So what does it mean yes. being a Baptist? That's a good question because there's a lot of different strains of Baptist. So I would say mine was more closely related to Southern Baptist, Mm. which is more conservative in clothing wise and rules like no smoking, no drinking, no dancing, um, like try to abstain from as many many, um, worldly pleasures as possible. And then there's apparently another denomination called American Baptist, which is like super liberal. So um, I'm not a Westboro, I'm not the American Baptist, I'm more Southern Baptist, which is still pretty conservative. Um, I feel like they've gotten even more conservative since I left it several years ago. Do people there have that accent that I would hear sort of like, I do declare, is that the kind of Southern? (laughs) If they're in the South, probably. Um, But there's like the Southern Baptist is all over the US. Yeah, you would hear that in the Southern churches. Mm -hmm. So... You went into your 20s. I read that you were celibate at that. It, was it just during the time Gosh. you were a pastor? What? No, it was before that. And you know what's so funny, Andrew, is I didn't even realize that until a few weeks ago in an interview. I was reflecting on my stories. I was telling someone. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I was celibate for six years. Like, wow. that's a lot of time. I could have had a lot of amazing experiences. But it just shows where I was at. I was celibate for... Um, like sometime before college and all of college and sometime after college. It was about six years total. And that's because I'm the kind of person when I date or go on dates, I'm the person who typically has sex on the first date. And in my religion, that's wrong. Premarital mm. sex is so bad and wrong. So the only way I knew how not to have sex was to not ever go on a date and not allow myself to go on dates. And so that's why I chose to be celibate as I was trying so hard to not sin. I was, I'm never the kind of person who can like date someone for a long time and not sleep with them. Like I'm just such a lover and a giver and a connector. And so I abstained and would kind of joke, but kind of be serious that I was dating Jesus because I didn't know what else to do. What else are you supposed to do with your huge sex drive when it's been demonized or penalized in that church space? So yeah, six long years. So before that time, you were not celibate as like a, you know, teenager in your twenties. And then, so that was a real, like, 
I'm going to change. I'm going to. Yes. There was like a conversion moment because I had sex in high school and it was crappy teenage sex with neither of us knowing any of us knew what we were doing. Um, but it, it, I felt a lot of shame over it, um, which was right. internalized from the messaging that if you have sex before marriage, you're you've lost value. And so at that point, I just kind of slept around and didn't care because I'm like, well, it doesn't matter now. I'm already ruined a ruined vessel or whatever you want to say. And then I had like a conversion moment, like, no, that's not what God wants for me. And so that's when I went the other extreme and was celibate for those years. Then you became a pastor. What is it like the first time you give a sermon? Because it must be quite daunting. There's a whole bunch of people and they're waiting for you to tell them how to sort of be godly and stuff. Oh my gosh. It it was not, I mean, I think you always get a little nervous. It wasn't daunting. It felt like I was home. Andrew, like when I stand on a, a stage and a spotlight, this is a mega church, big church, say, stand on a stage with lights on you and this eyes for you. It is the most invigorating, life-giving, oh my gosh, I was born for this kind of moment. I'm <laughs> wow. a speaker. I'm a teacher. I love humans. I love connecting. I love like going off of the energy in the audience and like engaging. And so I ate it up and I just felt like this is what I was born to do. I'm born to like teach and lead and speak and I'm finally being given that gift in my, uh, I think at this point, this is my early 30s. So no nerves. No, I think I would actually get nervous like on stage. And like once I stand, stood there, I was like, oh my word, I'm home. And you just knew what to say and everything. Yes, I, Andrew, I have so much to say. That's the problem. <laughs> I feel like <laughs> I need like infinite number of sermons just to like articulate my heart and the message or messages I want the world to hear. Um, yeah. It was always hard to fit my sermons within the time slot <laughs> so really what you were born to do i suppose was to perform you're a performer is that right yes totally absolutely yeah mm -hmm. what is that i guess i guess i must be one as well being a, a podcaster right and i made documentaries and I, I go on the screen so i remember i went to a, a therapy thing once because i used to live in argentina and they have the highest per capita mm -hmm of therapists in the world in Buenos Aires oh, wow. for some reason. So everyone goes to see a therapist there, like anyone in the, the whole country. And it costs like $10, so you just go along. Um, and one of the first things they said to me was, or the, the person, the guy said to me was, uh, you need applause. Like, and I didn't, I thought I hadn't even said anything like that. And I think it's quite a common thing. Even some listeners will be thinking like, oh, that's not me. And I think I, in some ways it will be, you know, I think everyone needs that in some way. What What is that for you? Why do you think you need that, uh, that applause, that light shined on you? Yeah, I think I agree with you. I think we all crave that because I think at the deepest level, what it means is you're seen and you're loved. Mm. And I think every single human yearns to be seen and loved in some way. And we all want it in different capacities. Some people get it just in their close friendships. Some get it from their intimate partnerships. And there's people like me or you who get it from a much larger scale. And I think honest, I mean, this might sound cheesy, but I think part of why I desire it on a larger scale is because I'm meant to have it on a larger scale. I think there's those of us who are born knowing we're going to have a global impact, knowing we're going to be global leaders, knowing we're, be, we're going to become celebrities. So when we have those moments where we perform and we're applauded or seen or rewarded, again, it feels like home because we're mm. doing what, what we were born to do. And I think it can be really beautiful. I, you, like anything, you can use it for good or for bad. You could be empty and need people's approval and you're trying to fill that void with applause or it can come from this is who I came here to be. This is the vision I have for my life. This is the work I'm called to do. And the applause feels appropriate but it's not replacing yeah. or trying to fill anything because you're already a whole and full person. So you said it was a mega church. Is that, I'm imagining like lights and spectacle and just like what, thousands of people? Yeah, there's 4,000 at that time. I don't know where they're at now, 4,000 members. And then we had about 20,000 people listening to the sermon every week online. Oh my God, that's quite a lot of stress. The the online thing, I don't mind, I, but 4,000 right. people in front of me, oh my word. <sighs> So, so what so you're you're going out you're you're a rock star every what is it once a week you're going out and you're just giving all this stuff performing people are lapping it up what changed to to make you go okay no more yeah i think it was i noticed for me for me and my church is behind the scenes the politics and the more i rose up in influence and power and status the more controlled and censored me and my work was. And I'm a very authentic soul. And so here I think I'm getting on stage to share my heart, but what is happening is I'm being told what I'm allowed to say and not say, allowed what I'm allowed to do and not do. And so now I felt more like a puppet than I felt like an authentic 
pastor. And um, there's a lot of stuff that went down behind the scenes that finally I said, I have to leave. This is not a place where I can be me, where all of me is loved and all of me is welcome. I very much have to hide parts and compartmentalize. I was a closeted queer because my church is not mm. um, queer inclusive. Mm. And it was really scary to walk away because that was my community for seven years. I loved those people. I held their babies in nursery. I taught their teenagers in youth group and I preached to them um, you know, during the services. But it was the only way I could save myself. What does um, queer really mean? Because obviously it was a word that was popular back in the 1930s and then it became a slur. And in the last 10 years or so, it's it come back into use. Yeah, great question. So for me, queer is an umbrella term for us in the LGBTQ community. So it could cover your identity or your orientation. It can cover up like your um, gender identity. So you can, be, you can say, I'm trans and I'm queer. I'm gay and I'm queer. For me, I'm queer and I specifically identify as pansexual. And for what that means for me is I'm attracted to your soul and your energy and your personality. And then whatever body you have, I like that too. It is not based on gender at all. You could also say I'm bisexual, but the reason I don't love bi is I think people tend to think I'm into like masculine men and feminine women and we miss mm. the entire spectrum of people i'm into i'm really into trans people i'm really into androgynous people i'm really into a gender people and my friends joke that i'm into gender benders i'm more into effeminate men or masculine women and so pansexual to me feels more inclusive of that than the word bisexual right that sounded almost a little bit religious and i, I think you noticed it as well when you said the soul you're attracted to the soul and then the person yeah. Is yeah, it, that's why I also okay. included like personality because it depends on the language you use. But there's just like it's your inner parts. I just really attract that connection or the 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 vibe we have. And it's less about the body, though I obviously have preferences like we all do. And it, like in general, I tend to be more, I'm more attracted to masculine energy, whatever gender you identify, because I'm very feminine. I want to be like the super femme. And then I want to be someone who's a little more masculine or more androgynous. Yeah. Ah. Wait, androgynous? Does that doesn't that mean sort of in, in the middle? Yeah, yeah, they don't really hmm. identify with either energy. But androgynous people tend to, to me, have a, a little bit more of a masculine feel, and it's who's so androgynous? Hot. I'm trying to think because I mean, is Emma Watson's a bit androgynous? Okay, I am the worst when it comes to celebrities. Like because of my upbringing, this is a perfect example. Oh my gosh, yeah. this is I feel slightly <laughs> gypped by my upbringing because I was very sheltered and I wasn't allowed to listen to anything but Christian music, and we weren't allowed to watch a lot of TV or movies. So I I missed a lot of those formative pop culture years. But the one celebrity I can think of because she's my cr celebrity crush, who's androgynous, is Ruby Rose. Don't know who that is. Okay, she was a fat woman and she was an orange is the new Ooh. black. But Okay. Ruby yeah. Rose. Mm hmm Natalie Portman's another one. Do you know who do you know who she is? I do know who she is. She's, She's more feminine to me. Uh, but well, she shaved her head, so that made me think Okay. Of that might make yeah. I might be a little more attracted to that. I don't think I knew that she shaved her head. Yeah, look up Natalie Portman shaved head. You're gonna be loving that. Oh uh, <laughs> I probably will. <laughs> you will. So That's amazing. I've heard you talk a little bit about there was a bit of an issue about your biracial heritage as well as what happened there. Yeah, it, it, being biracial in America is hard, because, and especially when you're white passing. I look white. So it's very mm. easy for people to just assume I'm white and completely ignore that there's a whole other part to my identity, my past, and my history. Yet you, I can't claim the title person of color because, again, I look white and that belongs to people like, especially in America, just with the racial disparities and injustice, I'm really sensitive about what terms I use because I don't ever want to take away from um, the African-American community where they are, you know, system systematically oppressed here in the U.S. But in my church specifically, you know, I, I think because I am biracial and because a lot of us are overlooked and we don't fit in either or. I don't fit in my, I'm half Korean and half white. I don't fit fully in Korean communities, but I don't fully fit in all white communities. And so me articulating my biraciality is really important for other biracial people or multiracial people to be seen. So I remember one time incorporating part of my heritage into my sermon and my pastor read over it and he's like, why is this even in here? This is dumb. No one needs to know about this. Get this out of here. He said, this is dumb. Yeah, it was insult. I was like insulted. Like he, the way he was, he insulted me, but it was so quick and so like automatic for him that I don't even think he realized he did it. And I felt like in that moment, I was like, 
I was being whitewashed. Hey, you look white, you sound white. Like, why are you even bothering bringing this up? No one cares. And that's, this is a white guy saying this to me. And I'm like, actually, it, it does matter. And a lot of people care because there's a lot of people in your audience who aren't fully white, people like me, who don't see themselves represented and who don't feel seen. Um, and so moments like that where it's like, what am I doing here? And why am I saying? So you left and yeah. decided to do something that is a, probably the biggest and even bigger rebellion than becoming a pastor yeah. by getting into what what you've termed as stripping, but it's not stripping like going to a strip club, is it? No. Yeah, it's hard to come up with the title. So I do all my work online um, mm. and I do it all through OnlyFans. And so you can call me an OnlyFans creator. You can call me, because I was trying to think like, well, I get paid to take my clothes off. So it's like technically stripping, but yeah, it's not your conventional dance on a pole in a club. Um, I've also been called a sex worker and I think that's a legit term. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure what the best word is there, but yes, it's, if I thought coming out as going to be a pastor was wild and rebellious, yeah, you can imagine how me coming out as an OnlyFans creator, stripper, sex worker was received by those in my community. Just doing the Lord's work in a different way. <laughs> yeah. How did your family react to that? Oh gosh, it's so hard for them. It still is. And it's just something we can't even talk about because it's just so triggering for them. And it makes me a little sad because I'm still the same person. I feel just as authentically Nicole doing this as I was when I was pastoring to the point that I even feel like I'm still a pastor because I do this super hot, sexy work. But Andrew, so many of my fans or clients come to me for life coaching support. How do I start my own business? How can I make more money? How can I leave my religion? Um, how do I tell this person I like them? How do I raise my child by myself? Because I'm also a single parent. You know, these deep conversations that are happening inside my community. And it's so beautiful and sacred. But it's just so easy to hear, oh, she's a stripper. She's a sex worker. She's an OnlyFans creator. And just be labeled and shut off and rejected by my people well if that's all you were then then you wouldn't have sort of blown up on the internet you wouldn't be having we wouldn't be having this conversation now because it would just be uh only fans person there are plenty of people on only fans so i think obviously what's interesting about you is all the different aspects which is that you're a life coach as well and uh and were a pastor from a, a religious yes. family yeah. oh. do, do you find that a lot of your um clients for life coaching are, are a lot of them sort of admirers as well and, and can that get mixed up yeah, I was nervous when I started doing this work that I would lose life coaching clients because that was my business first before I started this other business. Mm. But it actually, I get clients because I do this work, because they see me living fully expressed, fully unleashed, living life on my terms and like did it in a healthy way. I'm not like doing a bunch of drugs. And I'm homeless. I'm like happy, healthy, raising a beautiful family and having this appearance, which is true, that I have it all. I have a very successful career doing life coaching and this online work. And I'm also a great mom and a great partner and a great human. So it's actually grown my life coaching business. And, and then what's also cool is my only fans. I've had some of them go on to become life coaching clients or become course students. Yeah. And I love like the bleeding of my worlds together. That's part of what I, why I do what I do and why I'm so public about it is to me, there's no separation. There's no yeah. compartmentalization. I get to be a model and a mother. I get to be sexy and be taken seriously. I get to be risque and respected. And so by bleeding it together, my OnlyFans get to have the sexy stuff. But they also get the really powerful support they want. And then my life coaching clients who get powerful support also find permission and freedom to be sexy, to be seen, to be a little more self-expressed in whatever way they want to do it. And it's a win for everyone. But I suppose that's that's where it gets really complicated, isn't it? Because these are people who are obviously paying for your photos and stuff. And, you know, we can imagine, forgive me for being forward, what they're doing when they look at those photos, yeah. right? Yes, yeah. You're then in a role of almost like a therapist, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's life coach is quite a similar mm -hmm. thing, different qualification. Yeah. But uh, I, I think some people can sort of poo-poo the whole life coach thing. But I've got friends of mine who have seen life coaches and are happy and it's helped I know the German state, because well, I happen to live here, they they provide life coaching for people uh, who, who are unable to find employment and stuff, and it's very beneficial. That's amazing. Yeah, it's cool. A friend of mine was, was actually was doing that, and they were helping with, you know, and that was part of, he had to go to those life coaching sessions so that he could continue to get his benefits from the state wow, while looking for work. incredible. Mm, that's Berlin. But uh, so he's happy with it. Um, but... 
yeah, obviously, if you're in this sort of teacher slash therapist situation, this dynamic, and they've been doing whatever with the photos, I suppose, of course, you don't mind. But it's it's quite strange, and it must does it not sometimes get too intense? Are there do they ever go, cross a boundary with you in the life coaching sessions? Mm, no, my fans are so respectful. Like I know what they do wow. with my photos, and I I love it um, because part of it's like I'm able to like give them pleasurable experiences, give them connection, have hot sessions, hot moments, and they get to go deep with me, which I think is actually healing because a lot of us have been raised where we have to separate that. I can have like hot sex scenes over here, but if I want to have like deep conversations, I have to go over there. But why can't you get both from the same exact place? And so my fans have found it incredibly healing and they're the most respectful um, where like, and like even in our, me our messages, they'll say, Hey, what's okay to say or not say, I want to make sure I respect you and don't ever like go past your boundaries. They are initiating that conversation or they're checking in. Hey, I want to see, is this okay? Cause I have different fans who will like write erotica for me or who will do like a hot sexting session, but they're always checking. Are you okay? Is this okay to like, cross the boundary? And it's so beautiful. So I feel like what we're, what they're learning in there are life skills, how to communicate, how to connect honoring your own boundaries, honoring someone else's boundaries. So it's a life coaching session. Presumably you're helping them with something like to get back on their feet after a job loss or yes. girlfriend, that kind of thing. So what, when will they be going, is this okay? I'm pushing the boundaries a bit here. Yes, they, they never ask that in the life coaching sessions, but they ask that when we're like in OnlyFans DMing or they want to compliment photos or they want to say what they really feel about this video I posted. They're like, hey, can I say what I really want to say? Or what do you want? I'm like, yes, you can always be open and honest here. And I will always let you know if I feel uncomfortable. Um, but because I even just ask, there doesn't tend to be any moment of like, oh my gosh, why would you say that? So it's really beautiful space. That's when I was like, come check it out, you guys. Just be able to see a space where you can do super sexy, hot things, but also be seen and loved on both sides. It's incredible. I wonder as well, I mean, one of the things as you say, you use your own life as an example of how people mm -hmm. can do well. But I suppose that, again, the, the difficulty there maybe is like you have been deemed by the internet. They voted with their, you know, fingers or whatever, their keys, keyboards, as a sexy person. Not everyone's sexy, are they? Right, right. I think we're all sexy in our own way. But sure. yeah. So are you asking, like, I'm able to have this kind of, oh, yes, it's true. I will, <laughs> I will stand for that. Oh, my gosh. And that's also, I think, why I'm pan. Okay. I find lots of different people sexy for lots of different reasons and not like the typical Western civilized version we've been given. I, I think people are, are sexy in their own ways. But are you asking like, is that because I am have this kind of body or this look that's allowed me to have this kind of success? Like, I'm curious what your question is because I want to dive into this yeah. with you. Well, I actually don't know what it is either, to be honest. Okay. I'd like some clarification on what my question is. Is there a pressure when you're a life coach to have the perfect life to give off a very especially a Californian life coach to give off that kind of happiness and optimism and stuff mm -hmm. and it's funny because I think some people really really react to that really well and obviously those are your clients but then some people and maybe it's a fault of humanity it's a shame but some people get get upset by seeing other people do well yeah. when it's to an extent you know for example oh I don't have a boyfriend or girlfriend and everybody on Instagram does look how perfect everyone's lives are and do you ever worry that people will come to you and they'll see all of your success and they might try mm -hmm. to replicate it but you've got a very mm -hmm. particular path that you carved out mm -hmm. that most people wouldn't be able to replicate so does that concern you do you ever reach a point where you're like oh god with this particular person I don't know how to help them or is it is it always a way through Always the way through, always. And I, I live a very open life. So if you follow me on Facebook or Instagram, I'm all up in my stories and posting. And a lot of it, most of it is feel good, glimpses and like happy moments in my life. But I'm really authentic and open to where I've written very honest posts. Like even over Thanksgiving, I wrote a post how a year ago, I didn't know I'd be divorced less than a year later, you know, and just like kind of went into like the hard part of like, even though 2020 was my best year yet, a lot of hard things happen, right? My marriage blew up. I'm becoming a single mother, um, family, friend rejection because of the work that I do. And so I touch on it throughout the year. And so I think people get enough of a taste of like, yes, Nicole's really successful and happy and healthy and wealthy, but also there's a backstory to her success story. Like there always is to everyone's success story. And so I think people, so, and why I share what I share is to show people what's possible for anyone. Um, just before we got on here, I was, I was 
just posting on Facebook, which I didn't get to finish saying, because I just realized today, I've made more in January of 2021 than I made in all of 2019. Wow. And like, that's just like a huge, like huge leap. And I was posting it because I'm like, oh my gosh, I just realized this. And like, if this is possible for Nicole, because less than three <laughs> years ago, Andrew, I was making $0. Zero dollars. Wow. I had no money three years ago. And yeah. now I'm making in a month what I never even made in a year. Like, and I do it because I want to show people. And a lot of people who have followed me longer know that Nicole used to be broke and Nicole used to be really con like more conservative and really cared about what people thought of her to now not caring as much, doing what she wants to do, very happy, the wealthiest she's ever been. And I'm only getting started. And so I hope at the end of the day, if it triggers, that it gets to the point where I inspire because the same thing's available to you. It's not limited to just a special few. I, I, you're not supposed to ask this, but I know that all the listeners will be wondering when you say about January. So, I mean, how, how much are we talking or do you not want to say? Um, I So I'm making a month between 30,000 to 100,000 dollars a wow. month. So it's in that range, but yeah, so it's somewhere in there where I made more this month than I did in that whole year. Yeah, that's more than a lot of our years. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I never had a job that paid me 30,000 a year. So even that alone is huge. Um, and that's from OnlyFans stuff and life coaching. Yeah. Between those two. Yeah. It's just hard, isn't it? Because it obviously, obviously you're very entrepreneurial, which has helped you hugely. Not everybody is as entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. I suppose that's what you're helping them to achieve. But also not everyone is that sexy to, yes. to even if they are to you, they're not to most people. There is There is a sort of general <gasps> consensus of sexiness, isn't there? No, I disagree Come on. because here's the thing. Okay, two things. You don't believe that. You have a yes, no, I totally do. <laughs> two things. Income is never limited no matter yeah. what job you have. In fact, I have a client who's a doctor who's only supposed to make such so much in her career. She makes more than double that. That's not even supposed to happen. But she said there's no way that that I'm being capped there and she's created a life for her her job gives her twice as much as and what she should be paid. So this isn't just limited to entrepreneurs. When you work with me, whatever career you have, people tend to get unexpected bonuses, unexpected raises, unexpected pay promotions, things that should not be happening, things that have never happened before in their field. But for some reason, for my clients, these big, beautiful things happen. And that's because of how, what the universal laws I teach them and doing deep inner work. When it comes to being sexy, like, sure, you can call me sexy, but I follow a lot of models online, Andrew, because that's the work, the work I'm in. And I am like out of the sexiness scale, I'm like way at the bottom. I'm not the height. I'm not the weight. I don't have the curves. I don't have all the things that these super hot models with a much bigger following. And even if you join my OnlyFans, almost every single striptease video, I trip in. And you see the dork that I am. Like I'm trying to be sexy and sultry. And then I like trip over my own feet. And it's like, well, I'm not going to re-record this because I'm probably just going to trip again. Now it's become like a trademark. And my fans are like, please don't ever perfect your dances. You're so adorable when you trip, but it's like authentic versus you compare that to a professional pole dancer. And I would look like a complete amateur slash imposter, but because I'm honest and open and authentic, they eat it up. And so that's where like, Yes, I might be sexy or pretty, but I'm a dork. And like my people love that, you know, this person might not be as sexy, but they're hilarious. And like you just bust a gut every time you watch them or listen to them. We all have different parts of ourselves that are really magnetic and attractive and increases like our viewers, maybe perception of our sexiness. But you can make lots of money by being the fullest version of you. I think um, I think that's called parasocial interaction. The idea that uh, you make the the person on the other end of the screen feels like they're your friend. It's sort of been something that TV hosts have used since like the 1950s and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of influencers do a lot of that. Like, oops, I did it wrong. And then you still put it out there because people like to see the mistake. So I guess people feel quite close to you and everything. How do your yeah. how do your children? You've got three kids. How old are they? And how do they feel about this career choice? Yeah, they are ten eight and five and they're amazing and yeah they born witness to all this they were with me when i left the church they were younger than it's mostly just my oldest one who remembers that uh, a little bit from my middle child but yeah they've seen me evolve and they've seen me become really happy and really successful and the quality of life i'm able to give them because of my success and my work um, and they know that I do nude and lingerie modeling because I have lots of lingerie. I have magazines in my house that I've been published in. They flip through and see pictures of me. They've been here when I do shoots here. 
And they joke like, mom, your butt jiggles. And I'm like, everybody's butt jiggles. <laughs> like they're just oh my used God. to, yeah, like just being human. Like mom, like I walk around naked a lot and that's just normal for them. Um, and they don't know the specifics of my OnlyFans work. But what we do talk about a lot is bodily consent, bodily sovereignty. Kids do kids things. Adults do adult things. So I think by the time, which will be sooner than most of us think, they've learned about the work that I do. They won't be surprised because of like the, the nature of the work they see me doing and the kind of conversations they have. I think they'll think, oh, that's why mom is always talking about boundaries and consent and like adults do adult things. Cool. Like, and maybe they'll be grossed out by it, but I think they'll find the the principle is still there. Mom lives life on her terms, and that's the very thing she wants for us too. Don't underestimate a child's ability to feel grossed out by their parents uh, doing anything, <laughs> let alone doing yes. sexy pictures. Yes, totally. How do you do sexy pictures? I would ask this of anyone, man, woman, who's doing yeah. a modeling thing. There have been times when I look back at photos of me a few years ago when I was 20, whatever, and uh, I might have been doing a bit of a pose, a bit of a sultry pose or something like that. And you look back and it's just like, oh, it's a bit embarrassing. And you are quite a funny <laughs> self-aware person so is that sometimes a bit do you ever feel a bit um like what am I doing you know do you have do you have those moments in the middle of modeling yeah yeah sometimes like when I'm at the beach doing a shoot I like, feel like a beached whale I'm like how how do I make this look sexy because I don't feel very sexy right now like or I'll yell the photographer over the way like hey what are some ideas to how to pose because sometimes there's only so many ways you can pose on a rock um and then like you get the photos and like 98% of them are trash, but you get the 2%. And that's what people don't realize is like, you see all these super sexy photos on my Instagram. Um, but I had to eliminate thousands to pick those top ones. And so for every shoot, I do hundreds of photos. I'm happy if I get four or five, that's like a lot. Like, oh my gosh, we nailed four shots. That's amazing. So yeah, there's a mm. lot of them that are not so sexy and I'm awkward and you're trying different poses and you look at them and you're like, oh my gosh, please just delete. And that's part of the creative process. Who's the team that's doing it? Who's with you? Uh, it's different every time. So I work with all different kinds of videographers and photographers. And then of course, like any career, you find ones you really like working with. And so you repeat um, doing different shoots with them. But I work with all yeah. different ones and in different states. And I love it. I've got a question because I've got a I've got a Patreon, which is my own version of your OnlyFans, I suppose. And I get yeah. somebody to ask a question. They're allowed to ask a guest a question each week. It so happens this one's my brother, Michael Gold. Mm. So so don't be mean to him if you don't like it. But he wants to know, um, what does he write? Uh, do, do, you ever, do you ever feel like from going from a pastor to an OnlyFans model and a life coach that in some ways you've gone, you've left one religion and joined another one? Mm, great question, Michael. Um, He'll be happy. You know, he does, what he does highlight beautifully is the kind of the extreme nature of who I am. I'm the kind of person when I'm in, I'm all the way in. I don't know how to do anything halfway. I don't know how to be non-committal to what I love. So yeah, I went from one extreme to the other and I could see how you could label like, oh, you went from one religion to the other as an outsider. I think that's very easy to see and I wouldn't be upset if people thought that. But I think being on the inside of it, it's different because I'm free. Yeah, I don't think he meant it as a, a criticism oh, okay. at all. I think, he, I think he meant it just as a, just as a, an interesting thing. I don't think it was any anti-religion yeah. or anti-the life coach thing. Yeah, I'm pretty committed. I think the difference though is like I'm my own boss and I'm always checking in about what feels okay with me, what feels comfortable, what doesn't feel comfortable. And I give myself permission to change my mind. So if I start doing something inside my OnlyFans, I'm like, actually, I don't feel comfortable doing that. I have the freedom to change my mind and leave that. I even have the, the freedom to be like, hey, two months from now, I'm done. That was a fun little OnlyFans scent. Now I'm going to do something else. That's what I love. Versus in my previous life, I kept trying to like fit this mold and do what others expected me to do. So it's been an extreme change, but one that I'm allowed to mold to my own liking and leave, change, shift anytime that I want. Do you have those moments? Do you have moments where you think, what am I doing? Do you have regret? And, and Yeah, I, I think there's a mixture of both. I, because I'm a life coach, I'm deeply committed to the inner work. So when there is any form of like rejection, I always check in with my little, little Nicole, who always felt overlooked, misunderstood, never seen or heard in the way that she needed it. So I just check in like, hey, we're okay. This isn't a repeat of the past. It's just like, this isn't for us, or it's not, not now. There's something better. So I'm always checking in. 
And if I feel really upset, I'll let myself cry. I'm a crier. I probably cry almost every day. Happy tears, sad tears, anger tears. Like I just, I'm a crier. I'm a feeler, but I'm really good at shifting quickly. I can cry, feel like this sadness or grief or rage. And two minutes later shift and be like feeling good again. Cause I let it course in my body. I'm not, I'm not dwelling on it. I'm not repeating it in my head. It's like, okay, done. Moving on next. In the last couple of months, for example, what's the, uh, what's, what kind of thing might've happened that had given you some grief, maybe to do with your job mm. and then you dealt with it and then moved past it. Yeah. I um, hired a team to help me uh, recently with my business cause it's growing so fast and I, I don't have the ability to manage every detail like I used to. And this team came highly recommended and I was really excited and very quickly, I mean, within an hour of them, me hiring them, they started doing things I didn't like. I didn't feel comfortable with. They were making decisions about my business without consulting me. We'd have these team meetings, get on the same page, go away. And then later I'd find they did something with my business. I didn't give them permission to do. And like, oh, we just thought it's a better idea than what you told us. And I, like rage and grief because I thought like this was the solution I was looking for. And I felt um, ignored. I felt like they were taking advantage of me. They're just trying to capitalize on my success for their own success and just had so many confronting calls. And I remember within the first hour of me hiring them and I saw them do things that weren't right. I just like cried. I'm like coming back from Hawaii, like having the best week of my life there. And I'm like checking my business stuff and I just start crying. So I'm like so angry. I'm like, why am I paying you all this money? Why did you come highly recommended if this is how you act? You know, so he felt it, cried, and they got right back into boss mode, right? And then I fired them in the, at the end of the month. So, so it and it's stuff like that. Like I remember telling like my partner doing this, like I'm like crying, I'm like so angry. I'm like, this is what people don't see behind your empire building. Because I'm building this empire. I'm going to have this global company and brand. And like people see a lot of my success and happiness and travel and, the, and it's, all of it's real. But there's moments like that where I'm pissed off at a team member or I'm angry about this or this person says something really hurtful to me. And I'm just like crying in my bed, feeling it because I don't want to have any bitterness. And so I cry, I forgive and I get back up and try again. It's funny how quickly uh, I don't know if you feel the same way, but as soon as you have any success in something, uh, you can become very defensive immediately. And you go from being that person who like, who before the success was like, oh, I don't mind, just do it, do that however you want. I remember when my first documentary came out on the BBC, there was like a few weeks where we didn't know if they were going to put it out or not. And, so, and this, suddenly I went from being this guy who was like, oh, you guys do your thing. I don't want to get in the way. I went to this control freak, like of every little bit of the documentary, of the way it was going to be done. And anyone who pushed it, I had exact, I really related to what you said, where you start to feel that everybody's trying to, everyone's trying to capitalize on my thing. And it's amazing. Only years later, I was able to look back and think like, wow, I really lost the plot in that moment. I'm not saying that's what happened with you, of course. Mm-hmm. But I'm just, it's amazing how quickly that happens. You've totally. got a big thing. You've got a lot to lose now. Now that you've built a big thing, there's more to lose. Yep. Right. The more success you have, the more money you make that there is a common fear of like, I just have more to lose. That's terrifying. Anytime we delegate any of our work or we hire on a team, there is like that training and process and give and take. And like, it's a dance you're both trying to figure out because it's new for all of you. And I think just dropping any judgment we have on that and having so much grace for ourselves, for these people, for this experience. And hopefully we emerge a little wiser, a little kinder, a little smarter, and maybe a little more well off because we are able to find a win for everyone involved. But I just think that is totally part of the process. Do you remember your first time you went on OnlyFans, the first pictures you put up, how it felt? Did, did, you must have had some doubts at that point. You know, it's so funny because a fan just asked me this yesterday because she's wanting to start her own OnlyFans. She's like, what should be my first photo? And she's like, kind of having a hard time and kind of freaking out. And I was like, oh, that's so funny because I've been doing this for a while now, a year and a half. And I had to think back. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I remember my first photo. And I remember it because I was so excited. And I had had that photo for over a year, but I had nowhere to post it. And now it's like mild and I could totally post it on Instagram. But back then it was scandalous. It's my entire backside wearing this skimpy little lingerie. And it's gorgeous, a gorgeous (laughs) picture of my ass and body. And I remember like, oh, my gosh, I'm so excited. But then after that, I got more nervous because now like, what else are you going to show? What parts? So when I first started, I only did topless and I was pretty nervous. And then I got more nervous because some of my first subscribers were high school friends and old coworkers. So it's like, that's a whole different arena versus (laughs) complete strangers. If it's strangers, it's one thing. If it's your old high school acquaintances or crush, you're like, 
Um, That's really I, funny because because with this podcast, yes. I'm getting quite a few old school friends and stuff. People I haven't spoken yes. for 10, 15 years. And it's lovely because they say, oh, how nice to hear your voice. I go, oh, it's so ha- I'm so happy you're listening. But it's very different for, for your uh, line of work. Yes, it is. And even recently, a few months ago, I had a couple. Of, I was a high school teacher before I was a pastor. And I had a couple of my former high school students join my OnlyFans. And they're like, hi, Miss Mitchell. And I'm like, hi. Oh, my like, God. They're seeing a whole new side to their – and they're in their late 20s now. But it's just funny because, like, I'm still a teacher and they're, they're a teacher in their head. And they're still my student in my head. And now we're these adults encountering each other in a totally different arena. And it's just kind of – it kind of jars you a little bit. And it's always yeah. a little bit embarrassing or flustering. Do you encourage that, though? Or do you, do you, is part, does part of you enjoy that? Or are you really like, oh God? Um, I think I, I'm naturally, genuinely nervous. Um, but also I'm like, welcome to the adult world where you're allowed to evolve and change and become whoever you want to be at any point, you know? Um, mm. And I think it's really brave of them to subscribe using their real name and then even DMing me and saying hi, because you can be anonymous. So there's even something on their end where they feel comfortable enough, bold enough, yeah. To let them know, it's to let move. me know that I see them. Yeah, it's so interesting. <laughs> it's got quite gutsy. Yeah, it is gutsy. So that's why like, I respect it. Because I'm like, you could be here doing this and I'd have no idea. But the fact that you're letting me know of your presence, like, I think that it shows a level of authenticity on their part. Maybe I'm reading it wrong. That's how I read it. I think they're getting off on that. <laughs> probably. <laughs> so probably. tell me then. It kicked off probably, I imagine, more than you ever imagined it could have done. It really, you know, and then it really spiraled. I mean, that's where I read about you. I suppose I don't know where I read about you, somewhere online. But you went on Jimmy Kimmel. That was that was the big one. I'm trying to remember which one he is because there's two guys. That are the there, I know, Jimmy, Jimmy Fallon and Jimmy Kimmel. I like so Jimmy many, Kimmel yeah. more. I remember which yeah. one he is now. Yeah, I like him. Okay. He's really nice. <laughs> what was that like? Yeah. Did you go, was it during COVID? So it was cameras. Yes, it was done virtually. So I've been on there twice and they've just been for fun segments. The first time I was actually asked to go on a date with a female celebrity. And that was so exciting. I, it was my first girl date and it was her first girl date too. And so it was all done on Zoom and it was all recorded and um, would love to hang out with her in person. It was Nikki Glazier. I don't know how to say her last name. She's a comedian here in the US. Yeah. Right. That's cool. So that was amazing. On all recorded yep so it was all recorded and then they it that's that section of the segment was never aired so i like it was so funny i like told everyone like hey i was on jimmy kimmel you're gonna see me do this fun thing and it's airing on this day at this time and then the day and time comes and they cut our segment out and i was like never so mind typical. like that's just the world of tv yeah exactly yeah, yeah. typical um not shocking at all but hilarious because it was so anticlimactic and then they had me back um to be on one of their dating shows and that was our dating segment and that was another fun fun piece so they're always emailing me trying to get me on in these little ways and it's it's really fun oh that's really nice that so the dating thing what's they like a blind date kind of thing one of those like a game yeah they hooked you up with someone um and then jimmy had to guess whether we were a real couple or not by asking us questions and um. so that was a fun and there were several of us couples that he was interviewing and trying to figure out. And then you could win a prize um, if you That's great. If he guessed it right or not. Yeah. Do you ever worry that like you always need more? Do you, do you feel that way? Are you ever satiated? Because you start with the, you say the mega church, 4,000 people or whatever. And then obviously the only fans. And then Jimmy Kimmel. Like, do you have plans to expand more? Do you feel like it would ever be, and it's a question I would ask to a lot of people who are in any kind of showbiz, and you definitely are in showbiz yeah. now. Is it ever mm-hmm. enough do you, do you need more acclaim? Yeah, it's not about like if it's enough. It's about knowing what I want and what I believe is meant for me. So the level of fame and success I've made so far, I've had so far, is just the beginning. It's just like the tip of the iceberg. So like wow. I always joke about global dominance. Like Nicole's going to have her <laughs> empire. Like my goal is to be a household name. My goal is to have my own TV show. Which that's also in the works. I'm being pitched for all kinds of TV shows right now. I've, I've just been pitched last week to have my own radio talk show. Um, I'm being pitched by different ghostwriters to write my my book. Um, so all, which is all in alignment with what I want. I want to have my own TV show. I want to have my own movie. I want to have best selling books. Um, I want to be 
um, having that kind of impact, have that kind of brand and business. Mm -hmm. So the success and fame is amazing. But for me, it's just the beginning of what I'm I'm going to create. Well, you have me on your radio show if you get it. Yeah, that'd be amazing. <laughs> Look at us two Great. hosts talking together. Oh, yeah. Yes. So tell me, Incredible. last couple of questions, I guess, because what is it? Yeah. We've been some time now. Yeah, I mean, so how, how are things now with your parents? I know you said before it's quite complicated and stuff. Are you able to have a relationship? And like that part of your family, where are they now? Are they back in Ohio? You don't have to give me an address. Yeah, my family's all over. They're scattered all across the U.S. And um, so it's kind of nice having that physical distance because I can just live my life, do my thing. There's not like a daily or weekly or monthly run-in with my family because no one lives near me, um, which is given me space to become because I don't have to like try to fit in or blend in anymore. So it's still hard. Um, I'm estranged from some of my family members, which is super, super, super sad because I am such a loving person and would never want that. But um, I can understand why they feel like they don't, my influence or my work is not okay. Um, my parents are so great. They don't agree with it, but they, are doing their best to still love me through it. And I see that and it means a lot to me. That's really important. Yeah. That's sometimes, more, that's more important than Jimmy Kimmel calling you up or whatever, isn't it? To get a call, like that your parents still are loving. And if they call you yeah. and say, well done, we we believe in what you're doing and we're impressed and amazed by you. That can feel more than all those only fans, I suppose. Yeah, there's something there about like, I think we all crave the kind of love and acceptance by our parents, whether we want to or not. And recently I had a family member attack me in a group setting and my mom like stood up for me. And I, I, that's not, I don't know. I have not felt that from her for a while. And it was, I, I was so moved. I was so shocked because I'm so used to not being stood up for. I have to stand up for myself. I don't have, I don't have family members defending me. They're usually <laughs> the ones attacking me. Um, so to have her defend me and speak up for me, I just, it was a tender, tender moment. And I, I wrote her later saying like, I just want to say thank you so much. That meant the world to me. And I love you and appreciate you. So we had a really, a really tender moment there recently. I'm really grateful. What did she say? Um, the fact that she said something at all. Um, it's In my family, we can be pretty passive aggressive. We sweep things under the rug. We don't want to acknowledge what happens. And it drives me crazy as someone who tries, who's trying to end unhealthy generational patterns and start better ones for my children. Um, it's forced me to like kind of break away so I could figure out what I want and how I want to create my family line. And so having my mom even just speak up was a huge thing because it's so easy to just like, well, Nicole's an adult, let her take, like she can handle this one. And she didn't, she just spoke up and said, Hey, like, I don't know. I don't know what she said. Cause it was like, she like talked to that person separately. Um, but she called me right away. She texted me right away. Hey, this wasn't okay. I'm here. If you want to vent, I'm so sorry. Um, and I was just like, Oh my gosh, like, just that, that she reached out to me directly, quickly, personally, and then also went off to the side to handle things um, to speak up for me was a deep expression of love to me. What a pleasure it was to speak to Nicole Mitchell. Remember to find her on OnlyFans, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, her website. It's all in the show notes. She'll probably be joining me on Thursday at 8 p.m. GMT on Discord. The link is in the show notes. I don't think you have to sign up or anything like that. You just give in a username. It can be anonymous if you want. I'm just going to play you a minute to show you what the future bonus content will sound like, which will in the future only be available on Patreon. It's just a few minutes at the end of our conversation that are perhaps a little less edited and slick, a little more personal and just uh, natural, I suppose. Is there anything I haven't asked you? I always ask people at the end, is there something that you just, yeah. usually there's nothing, but if there's just something I've complete, I, I'm panicking. I always panic that I'll put it out because it always happens. I put it out and I'm like, so I did one with, um, I don't know, so an ex-Mormon. And then someone's like, did you ask them if Mormons are polygamous? And I'm like, oh, I forgot yeah. about that. You know? <laughs> so mm. that is always the most obvious question I always forget to ask. So I'm just... Um, yeah, let me think. Stuff about the OnlyFans, about how it grew, about... I don't know. Yeah. You know, it's, I, I'm just going to kind of ramble here and then you can feel free to edit, cut, whatever. Um, 
I think what's really been interesting about this pivot in my life that, and like, it's very sensational pastor turned stripper, but on a deeper and a more personal level, the healing that's happened because of that pivot, it can be easy to see that as like wild, rebellious. She's broken. She's messed up. She's lost her way, whatever. But for me, it's been a journey home to myself. And even things like I, like my sex life has never been great. And I'm a very sexual person. And I thought all these years there was something wrong with me. I was broken. Um, I'm too much. No, there's no one out there who wants to like be with me or pleasure me. These are stories I picked up on for many different reasons. And then once I emerged into this world and doing the work that feels really authentic and true for me, and I became single again and started dating, like experiencing the kind of love I've experienced, experiencing the kind of sex I've been having, the pleasure I've been receiving as I'm creating this beautiful art for people to enjoy. It's been so deeply healing. And a lot of it has been healing from religious trauma that taught me a lot of body shame. It taught me sex shame. Um, it taught me to always censor everything I do think or say, and now I'm in a space where I'm just open to receiving and giving and experiencing and multiplying. And it is so, so beautiful. And now because of that, I have so many, especially women reaching out to me saying, Hey, I've never had an orgasm before, or Hey, my partner's not able to get me off. What do I do? Or Hey, I'm with a woman. I don't know how to get her off. How can I help? We're having deeper conversations because of how open and honest I've been with my own journey. And I think that's what's been really surprising is how healing my sex work has been for me and for my fans and the people that I serve. So just a little inside glimpse to how much deeper this work is than the sensational tagline. I quite often have listeners getting in touch to say, hey, I bought so-and-so's book. I watched their film. I did that thing. And I'm interested to know how many will get in touch and say that they signed up to your OnlyFans. I think they would tell me more if they sign up to your life coaching. They, there's, you know, why wouldn't they tell me about that? So maybe I would be interested. Any listeners who do that mm. afterwards, you know, let me know. I'm quite, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about that. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really, you know, it's been beautiful and lovely. Thank you so much, Andrew, for having me and congratulations on your, all of your success. I'm always so happy Aww. when I see people doing well, doing what they love, because I think that's how it's always meant to be. So well done. Oh, Keep thank you. you. And thank, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to stop. I'll turn the recording off now. Um, yeah. But okay. Here yeah, I'll stop mine too. yeah, please. And yeah, seriously, you know, thank you so much. It's been absolutely wonderful. Well, that was inspiring from Nicole. Remember, if you want that kind of bonus content in future, sign up on patreon.com slash andrewgold. Thank you everyone for your gorgeous reviews this week. There have been a few more of late, which is amazing and helps the podcast find the right audience. So please keep reviewing on Apple. I'm just going to summarize some of these. Peacock Bird wrote, Fascinating topics, refreshing in a sea of celeb podcasts where they're punching above their intellectual weight or talk about themselves far too much. Very damning. That is damning, isn't it, those celebs? I agree, Peacock Bird. Thank you. And Meg Del B wrote, Lovely stuff. Such a great podcast. As a child therapist, I am naturally fascinated by humans and everyone's unique experiences. This podcast allows a snippet into the lives of those with such diverse, intriguing experiences. And how lovely to receive a message from somebody with such a great insight into the human psyche. Uh, So thank you. Um, Coffee Before Life wrote... What a great name that is, by the way. Coffee Before Life. With a baby and young child, this podcast allows me to switch off and listen to super interesting people thanks to the ease of Andrew's interview technique. Happy Mondays. That's a band, isn't it? I don't know much about them, though. And Dingheads wrote, Andrew and his interesting guests fill my dog walks and enable me to think deeply around diverse subjects. Brilliant podcast. The Bigamist is my favourite so far. I love The Bigamist. That's Mary Turner Thompson. That was a that was a ten or fifteen episodes ago, maybe twenty. It was quite a while ago, and that was a great episode. Um, very very sad about how her husband was a was a psychopath and uh, took all her money. Thanks to those posters and all the lovely messages you're sending me on Andrew Gold underscore OK on Twitter and Instagram. There's a Facebook website as well, facebook.com/slash On the Edge with Andrew Gold. 
good luck writing the whole podcast name with no spaces. It's not an easy thing to do. Next week, I think I'm speaking with The Innocence Project about people who are wrongly convicted and sent away to prison. Imagine being in prison your whole life for something you didn't do. I, I honestly, I can't think of many things that are worse than that. So I'm really intrigued to see what he has to say. There'll be some fascinating stories. And I'll see you then. Or I might see you before that on Discord on Thursday. So let's see.